arrogance. I've been waiting. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't pointing at you. I just want to find out. It's missing. <laughs> I know, he's there, yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Arrogance. Okay, so there are many different types of arrogance. Interesting. Wow, oh, right? Why? Why? You don't even know what it is, arrogance. Anyway, it's an interesting one because, of course, there are coarser levels and subtler levels. Subtler ones. So the subtler ones are the ones to hate, to look out for. So even though we may think of ourselves, and we usually are humble, it's possible, but every now and then that sense of arrogance, it just comes through. Okay. All right. Pardon? Pride? Yeah. Well, pride, I don't use the word pride, because like, if you're proud of someone, that's a good mm-hmm. thing, right? And pride can also be... Well, it depends, of course. Sometimes arrogance and pride are used interchangeably. But it can also be something helpful, like poor in Tibetan. Like it means like you're you feel comfortable with yourself. You feel self confident, and that's often translated as pride. But it depends on how you use the word. So taking pride in doing something. Doing very good, yeah. Doing pride in something, taking pride in something, as in like. Rejoicing in your own action without feeling excessively arrogant or feeling arrogant about it. Okay. So, arrogance. Oh. So, arrogance is a mental factor that focuses on ourselves and exaggerates our good qualities or superimposes good qualities we do not possess. Right? Sometimes we may think, I can do something really, really well, but maybe I can't. I'd like it. I'd like to have those qualities and I don't possess them, or I just exaggerate those good qualities. While apprehending those qualities, we feel conceited and superior to others. Okay? They could just be these slight moments. Like sometimes when, over the years, and... Initially, I, I did the same thing. Like when I came to the nunnery I'm staying in right now, I felt like I had really good ideas and theirs wasn't working properly. And you know, nowadays people also come there and I'm sure they have great expertise, they know how things work, and they make suggestions of improving it. But for the nuns, they have their system. It may sometimes take a little longer or be a little bit more complicated, but it works great for them. It works much better than some of the systems we have in the West. It works well for a Western mind, um, but it's just around here, it's not appropriate. But then again and again, people come and have suggestions and like, right? <laughs> and then and they're like, and they're too polite to say something, so they give the person a tea and they listen to what they have to say. <laughs> and of course, they don't implement it because they've tried these things before and they have now a way of doing it. So, <laughs> right? And, in that moment, I think there may be a sense, I mean, I'm just thinking of my own, in that very moment, I just know better, right? A sense like, I have a better education, I know, kind of, right? And of course, that's not always the case. I mean, better education, well, maybe certain things I know better. I have this really good friend, um, a nun who didn't get any education. She didn't learn how to read and write when she was younger. And certain things she finds difficult. <laughs> it's very interesting when she writes me an SMS and she writes it. She doesn't have Tibetan on her phone, so she writes it in English. And I don't understand what she writes. I have to read it aloud. Mm-hmm. And then I get it. I'm on the bus having a headache. Oh, she means headache. It's kind of like, it sounds like headache. So it's very difficult, but she's so clever. When it comes to other things, like organizing things, and I usually ask her, you know, how should I do it? How should I do it like this or like that? I figured out over the years her expertise. Like she's so good at things, you know, kind of organizing certain things. So maybe spelling and and all that she struggles with. Uh, Mathematics are also a little difficult. Uh, but she became really good when she was the accountant of the nunnery, so <laughs> I still love her numbers. <laughs> really cute, actually. But that's just, you know, she had to learn it from scratch, and she's very good at it now. Um, but, yeah, so these other things that she's so clever and unbelievable, so straightforward. So 
everyone has their field of, of uh, expertise, of course. And sometimes we may feel a sense of arrogance. I mean, like just a small moment, like, oh, I just know better. That's it. That's that kind of state of mind. Arrogance is rooted in the ignorance that apprehends an intrinsically existent I and in the arrogance that apprehends the intrinsic existence of our own good qualities. It creates a lot of unhappiness, especially when there's evidence that the image we have of ourselves and of our positive qualities is distorted and not in accordance with reality. And of course, if other people act accordingly, we strongly believe we have these qualities. And I mean, even the humblest person has it. Even the humblest person has a sense of, you know, certain things that you feel you're good at, and then if someone objects to that, there's a, mm, well, right away, it's a sense of, it's arrogance. If, if someone doesn't recognize our good qualities, doesn't give us credit, right? That, like, not, that someone doesn't give us credit, doesn't, we did something really good, and at least we want the other person to thank us. There's a sense of arrogance involved in that. Like, I did really well. They should appreciate that. Pardon? That's the ego, isn't it? Well, it's, it comes from an exaggerated sense of self, but it also comes from, in that moment, you exaggerate your good qualities or what you've done. Right? So it's not, of course, first of all, the ego, what does that mean? The ego doesn't exist. So it's really the mind that perceives the ego, right? I, I know what you mean when you say the ego, but strictly speaking, in a philosophical sense, the ego that we perceive is actually not there, so it's a mind that misperceives an ego. But from there, it spins an entire story. It perceives my own qualities as more important, that's self-cherishing. It, uh, it overemphasizes my good qualities, which is arrogance. Or overemphasizes or not just overemphasizes. I mean, I see it in myself. Sometimes I'm really proud of something... And in another person, I would just say, so what? <laughs> it's nothing special, <laughs> right? <laughs> so in ourselves, I find in myself, I think, hmm. But in another person, I wouldn't. So I'm overemphasizing that quality in myself. That's arrogance. Right? And in particular, like when I do something well, you know, I'm proud of myself. So being proud of myself, that's fine. But when I expect, when I expect, um, something from another person and I feel hurt if this doesn't happen. It should be sufficient that, you know, I've done well, I did a good job, okay, let's move on. Why do I need others' approval? But when I need that, it, there, there's an exaggeration. Now other people need to know about it. Right? And again, I, I believe this is a form, according to this description, you have a form of arrogance. It creates a lot of unhappiness, especially when there's evidence. Yeah, this is not in accordance with Furthermore, it can be a great obstacle to deepening our understanding and to increasing our good qualities. So, of course, there's so much we need to learn. And if we feel like, oh, I know already everything, that's a huge obstacle. So, that can be the case when, when someone comes to the Dharma, uh, when they're already a little older, as in, like, they... they Depending on their background, of course, people who study their entire life, they're just, okay, something more to study, right? Depending on their, what they do. But sometimes people have, I don't know, studied until the age of maybe 25, then they started their job. So they're not so used to studying, and they come back to study. And it's really difficult for them to get back into it, and they feel like they don't know anything. And, and it's really hard for them to pick up on it. I mean, everyone is different. Some people are very curious. Oh, how lovely, great. Something to learn. I haven't had that opportunity for so long. But for some people, it's a little hard. And they kind of say, I feel like I don't know anything. So there was this sense of like, I knew something. I had some. And now they're suddenly in a field where they don't know, right? Maybe they learned Tibetan. They don't know the language yet. It takes longer to learn Tibetan than any Latin-based language for instance, probably for Indians easier to learn Tibetan uh, than for a person who's, you know, got English as like a native English speaker or a native German, French, etc. speaker. So the point is that we have this sense of like, I know this, and, and in those moments we feel inadequate or we feel low about ourselves. So there's a sense of arrogance that could be one of the reasons. It could be a reason for that. Right? 
And like I said before, sometimes it's really hard for monks and nuns who are already established in a certain profession suddenly to come here, and they're nobody, right? Because we say, like we say, for instance, in German, there's a saying, I don't know how to translate that into English, but your clothes, your clothes define who you are. You're defined by your external appearance. And oftentimes people wear certain clothing because they want to be defined in a certain way. But as a monk or a nun, right? You're like, as I say, all of it's taken. You just become like everyone else. So your previous identity, that's gone, if that meant something to you. And sometimes it can lead to, it's almost like if your, 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 conscious, your, your awareness or your consciousness tries to balance that out in a sense of arrogance in certain like areas, because otherwise you lose your self-confidence. So this is how the mind balances it out. But it's not a healthy way of balancing in that moment, and so therefore it's important, because it's painful, it's painful for that person. So, and I notice it sometimes when someone, people become really uptight. A lot of new monks and nuns, when they're already older, it can be, not in all cases, but it can be, they become really uptight, really uptight. Because they're out of their comfort zone, they're in an environment they're not used to, and suddenly whatever they've done no longer counts. Could it be attachment to the self? Of course, it's the that's definitely that's the the root basically misperception of the self, attachment to the self, right? Of course, this is what governs all our actions. But depending on the circumstances, it comes out stronger, it comes out less strong. And certain changes in life, of course, they can be very challenging, and then those come up. And from a Buddhist point of view, they're good. They show us what we still have to work on, right? The problem is when we're too arrogant. <laughs> when we're too arrogant. When we're too arrogant to feel like to see my negative qualities, right? That's the problem. So of course we have good qualities, but we also have negative ones, and that's fine, right? It's fine. Why not? We're not Buddhas yet, right? And so if others see those in us, to always remind ourselves we have good qualities too, okay? And may, maybe sometimes people just see the negative ones. Well. They haven't gotten to know us yet, you know, to a degree, uh, getting to know us yet, so to a degree that they get to know those. So it's such an amazing balancing act with your own awarenesses, with your own mind, right? Sometimes there's pride, then you hate yourself. And sometimes there's arrogance, then you hate yourself, right? And you get back from that. Uh, and then there's attachment, and then it's kind of like if we just had one emotion we had to struggle with, okay, but then there's so many. But in fact, they're all kind of expressions of that attachment, and of course of the misperception of reality. And Buddhist practice is really, initially, my teacher usually says that, Geshe Tukdum Pesala, he puts it very beautifully. He says, when you first start practicing the Dharma, it is described usually as a journey. So, for instance, the different techniques you apply, they're called path. So it's like spiritual journey. Of course, you've all heard that, that, that kind of expression. So it literally is like a journey. You set out to go somewhere. And the goal, of course, is liberation of Buddhahood. And he says, first setting out, that's like you leave your village somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And there's this bumpy road with lots of potholes. And it's difficult. And you're, it's so difficult, right, just to travel for a kilometer or whatever, for, uh, just at a time, right? just to move on. Sometimes you feel like you take two steps forwards and three backwards. <laughs> You're not really even moving forwards. And at some point, you reach the highway. So this is when you've learned to control the mind better. You can now generate compassion and love at will. The other afflictive emotions, when they arise, oh, they're laughable. Right? They're, 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 they're there for a moment and you let them go and other ones come. It's just part of the story and never mind. So he says initially that's the hardest. Initially it's really like impossible. Enlightenment seems further and further and further away. The more you learn about it, the more you get to know your own mind. You're thinking in Tibet and they say, it's like that. You know? From here to here. It's like enlightenment here, I'm over here. Like no way. So that's like this bumpy road. But at some point, things get easier, and then it's the highway. And the further you get, the, the easier the road, the wider the road, the faster the car. That's the good news. Right? So initially, it seems almost impossible. 
right? But it gets easier as you progress. All right. Anyway, going back to this here. So, um, well, it's definitely an obstacle to increasing our good qualities. So, again, when we do frustrations, it's also seen as, like, you lower yourself. Again, like, kind of, again, there's something greater than myself. And so, you know, kind of seeing that. And it's not important to do the physical ones. It's really the mental. Like I said, frustration is actually something internal, right? kind of lowering yourself uh, in a literal as well as in a uh, symbolic kind of According to Vasubandhu's Abhidhamma Kosha, so here is less Asanga, here is As- Vasubandhu. Uh, in, in a lot of the texts, they take his explanation of seven types of arrogance. So one is just called arrogance, then excessive one, etc. Arrogance beyond arrogance. <laughs> Sounds nicer in Tibetan. Um, arrogance is in, in general, so I don't know whether they're so different from each other, so that's to be debated, to be seen. Arrogance is an inflated mental factor that considers ourselves to be superior to those who are inferior. So a sense of just in general feeling superior sometimes to other people. And you see, if you're usually very, very humble and you only have a second a day of in, uh, in arrogance, it's hard to recognize. Like I said, even the humblest people, certain things you say to them and then it's like, hey, it's there even the humblest people. So it's wonderful that they're so humble, but it doesn't mean if you're in general humble, not every now and then you don't have a sense that there's no arrogance. Same with anger. I mean, people that we think they never get angry. I, I mean, people that think they never get angry. And they're just in moments of resentment or dislike. It's, it's a form of anger. So then excessive arrogance. Excessive arrogance is an inflated mental factor that considers ourselves to be superior to those who are our equal. Now, again, equal is, again, relative. Equal in relation to certain things, right? In relation to, for instance, they are the same class. Academically, they are the same class, or maybe equal in that way. Or they hold the same position in their job. Um, Or they have the same income. It's all relative, of course. It depends on the situation. And so, actually, there's not much of a difference between us. I somehow feel I'm better than them, right? Then arrogance beyond arrogance is is, inflate, is an inflated mental factor that considers ourselves to be too superior to those who are actually superior. So, you know, if their knowledge is greater, they have actually better knowledge, for instance, or they're better at cooking food or whatever, right? And I feel like, no, I can do it better. That's kind of bizarre. I mean, we're, how could it be? Like, in, in that area, of course, with regard to something else, if I can really good at repairing cars... Then, with regard to that, if I feel, okay, that's different, if I am really better, that would not be arrogance beyond arrogance. But it's something where we are totally deluded about the fact they're actually better than us. And not being able to bear it. There's also competitiveness, jealous, like envy. And out of that, we may spin the story, actually, much better, like they just don't know, or something. Right? Okay. Then there's the arrogance of thinking I. Arrogance of thinking I is an inflated mental factor that thinks I by fo- that thinks I by focusing on the aggregates. Some explain the I here as referring to the non-existent self, while others explain it as referring to the conventionally exist conventionally existent I. If it refers to the non-existent self, this arrogance apprehends an intrinsically existent self and feels inflated about it. Like I am better, I am special, just in general. It's a kind of self-attachment too, right? If the I, uh, if the I, if the I is no, if the I, the, this arrogance takes to mind is the conventionally existent I, then it merely fle- feels inflated about the conventional I without apprehending its intrinsic existence. That's also possible. It's just induced by, of course, the mind of intrinsic that grasps that intrinsic existence, but it doesn't particularly f- apprehend an inherently existent I. Just I in general, without. Exaggerating, it still appears as an inherently existent I, but the mind doesn't actively apprehend it and feels inflated about it. So they're different versions, they're different kind of possibilities. And both exist. Sometimes we don't necessarily apprehend an inherently existent I, just I in general. It's only appearing as inherently existent. And then we may add things to it, such as we're better than others, etc. 
If the eye, you know, like maybe this is also a cultural thing. Because, well, Tibetans are usually very, very humble. But of like low self-esteem and the opposite arrogance, and they don't actually, actually exclude themselves. I mean, we have moments of low self-esteem, we have moments of arrogance. But I think Tibetans are probably have more of a problem with arrogance than low self-esteem. I mean, they're very proud people. They're very proud. And it's, it's beautiful in that way. I mean, very self-confident. Like I already said, they're self-confident. Um, even though they sometimes work in lowly jobs, maybe. But it doesn't bother them because there's a very healthy strength of self-confidence. So if that's exaggerated, it may lead to arrogance. It may lead to arrogance. Now, you sometimes it's the sense, I'm Tibetan. And Tibetans are a little better than others. But I come across that sometimes. It's a very human trait. It happens. And you may wonder sometimes, his holiness, when he speaks about Tibetans, he always praises them. He always says, usually he says, Tibetans are special. We are special. We have a special culture, a special language. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes people wonder, well, they have already kind of a strong sense of like Tibetans. So isn't that harmful? Of course, it has a disav- it may have the disadvantage of increasing that pride if it already exists in people. However, on the other hand, um, of course, you know their situation. So to, for Tibetans to be proud of their culture and preserve their culture, which is so helpful, that's why it's done. Okay? And I'm, I can just tell you honestly, although I lived with Tibetans for so long, it's been very difficult to make Tibetan friends, especially with women. Okay, so I'm just telling those because I didn't know that was the case, and I thought I just did something wrong initially. <laughs> I tried really hard to make, you know, as a nun, I wanted to have Tibetan women, female friends, and it was really difficult. And it's in this, especially here where they live in exile, they're very closed. They're quite closed because they're like the small community that try to be among with with one another, and women are educated in a way to be at home stay in the home if the men are more educated or they have much more access they're much more encouraged in Tibet itself to go out and, and meet other people so the the women in Tibet they usually stay at home and they don't go out to trade to other places etc so traditionally it's much harder to get to know Tibetan <coughs> women and here in Dhamsala I talk to Tibetans who come from abroad they have a hard time they say like we were brought up in in like, even if they have relatives here, they're slightly different. And I met this one Tibetan girl who has lots of family here, but she was, she was brought up in the West. She was a hip-hop dancer. <laughs> <laughs> Very outgoing Tibetan girl speaking her mind. She was so different. So the other girls were like, whoa, she's really different, <laughs> right? And when I once talked to her, and, I, and, I, and she said, oh, I don't belong here. I know I don't, right? It's just, so it's nothing personal. It's just how it's developed. For nuns, it's just as difficult, very difficult to get to know Tibetan nuns. For other Westerners, so don't if you if you try and you don't succeed, don't worry, it's not you. <laughs> it's just the whole system, right? But it's easier for men, and of course, as nuns, we don't want to. With my classmates, it was easy. You know, there were my classmates, there were monks, they were much more open, and through them, I got to know a lot of Tibetans because they were there were their relatives. But other than that, it is difficult. It's just the way it is. Never mind. It's not the end of the world. But just to say that that's just part of the culture. Um, and so that it's, it's, Tibet used to be a closed country. It used to be the forbidden country. They didn't leave anyone in. Why? Because they were scared to lose their culture. And there's a little bit still left of that, especially here in this area. In this, because they have greater responsibility to keep the Tibetan, to keep the Tibetan way... Um, I hear from Tibetans when they come here, they say, oh, we're not like that. Here, Tibetans is a little bit different because everyone looks at them as the place where his holiness lives, right? And so his holiness praising, sometimes his holiness, of course, also scolds Tibetan. When things happen, he says, this is not okay. This is a disgrace. People shouldn't act like that. Tibetans should be kind and compassionate. And they are. They really are. But to kind of become really friendly with them and to get to know them, it's a little difficult. So just that you know about how the culture works. And um, yes, they, they have pride, a healthy amount of pride. But every now and then, it may also, arrogance may come in. So I'm wondering, maybe these seven types 
uh, I mentioned, because that may be more of an issue rather than self-hatred, for instance. I don't know. But of course, as Westerners, we also have, or as, as Indians, Westerners, whoever, like being brought up uh, in the modern style of life. So we also have our amount of, you know, pride or arrogance. It's just a natural... Was an Indian scholar. That's true, but the Tibetans took that from Abhidhamma Kosha, kind of took that out. They mostly followed Asanga in his explanations of the different um, afflictive emotions, but then uh, uh, they took this in particular. I mean, Vazabandu just mentions all the different ones, but the fact they took it, yeah. All right, anyway, I, I don't know, I'm just, this is just a theory about why they maybe took it out. And they are humble, in, so don't get me wrong, they are humble in general, but the way I just explained it, if there's more of a tendency, it could be that. All right. So, um, if, the eye is this, if the eye, this arrogance takes to mind, is the conventionally existent eye. Oh yeah, I've just read that. So either way, this type of arrogance is a deluded mind that feels inflated about our identity. For instance, it may feel inflated about being European, American, etc. So whatever is your identity, a sense of feeling inflated about it. And then, oh, His Holiness didn't say Trump was selfish. He said he lacked moral principles. That's what he said. Not selfish. I don't know why I got that. That was my interpretation. Moral principle. He lacks moral principle. I, I checked it. But just said something about Modi and tariffs. He hasn't said anything. Tweeted anything about. Oh, he didn't tweet. Oh, he probably takes a while for it to sink in. <laughs> He has no one more. He doesn't know what more principles. He has to look it up first. No, no. Anyway. All right. So then, arrogance of conceit is an inflated mental factor that thinks we have attained good qualities that we do not possess. Okay. That's basically already mentioned to some degree before. Arrogance of slight inferiority. Arrogance of slight inferiority is an inflated mind that mental factor that thinks one is only slightly inferior to those <laughs> that are great. <laughs> I mean, we have that too, right? Arrogance being arrogance is kind of the same. Yeah, I know. I don't know why it goes into all these. I don't know. For some reason, they are mentioned, so I mentioned them too. Maybe someone finds them helpful. <laughs> No, it's not the same. There's a slight difference. There's a bit of a difference, right? Well, I mean, we can go. We can take seven types of anger. I haven't done that with anger, so with arrogance. Never mind. Maybe whatever. Wrongful arrogance is an inflated mental factor that thinks that one has attained excellent qualities while one has not attained such excellent quality, but rather has attained faults. <laughs> All right. Anyway, now you know about arrogance. <laughs> okay. So that's as part of the. Mm, the, what's that, what they call the six uh, main kind of primary afflictions. Then there's ignorance. As mm -hmm. explained before, ignorance refers to either a mental factor that is merely confused with regard to the nature of an object, or it refers to a mental factor that actively apprehends the opposite of what is actually there. Now, what's Sankarpa explained that ignor ignorance, which is one of the ten afflictions, refers mainly to ignorance that is mistaken with regard to the Four Noble Truths the law of cause and effect, and the nature of the three jewels. However, it can also refer to the ignorance that apprehends intrinsic existence, to ignorance that apprehends phenomena that are impermanent as being impermanent, and so forth. All right. So like I said, I'm not so sure why this is part of the non-views, because in a way it is a view. Um, Lama Tsongkhapa is saying that it refers maybe mainly with regard to the Four Noble Truth, that they're not correct, etc. Okay, well, anyway. Then there is doubt, but afflictive doubt. So as explained above, doubt is in general not considered to be an affliction, for it can be one of the stepping stones to gaining a correct understanding of reality. However, here, afflictive doubt is a mental factor that serves as an obstacle to spiritual development, for it is an awareness that, despite correct reasoning, does not transform into a correctly assuming consciousness, and that continues to waver with respect to the Four Noble Truths, the Law of Karma, the Three Jewels, and so forth. It is too pointed and undermines our ability to engage in any action, in any action with confidence and resolve. 
So the Tibetans, oh, it says it comes here. Furthermore, it hinders us from committing ourselves wholeheartedly to a particular practice or to remaining diligent in our effort to accomplishing a desired <laughs> result. There is a Tibetan saying that just as we cannot saw with a two-pointed needle, we cannot accomplish our goal with doubting with a doubting two-pointed mind. It's a nice example, isn't it? You can't point, you can't stitch with a two-pointed needle. So likewise, if you're always doubting, you won't be able to come to. Skeptical, to be skeptical, and to be doubtful. Ah, in in general, to be skeptical, I think doesn't really mean to have doubt but you could have doubt and I, like I said there's a good type of doubt right this is the negative type of doubt so a positive type of doubt versus skepticism I think those are those two are good both of them are, are good so of course we say don't be too skeptical that would be like being exaggerated but usually being skeptical is a good thing so I think you may be skeptical just because it's about a different religion that you don't know about. So may go like, I'm not sure. Maybe that's just an Asian weird thing. So there may not be any doubt. You just right from the beginning are skeptical. And that's a good thing. You always analyze. You never take things on face value. Right? Uh, you may first be skeptical, then that leads to doubt. But if, if it's a particular system that actually is based on reasoning, that may then change and you generate conviction. Or you may have doubts, of course, and that leads you to skepticism. Oh. I don't know, skepticism, what, is that different from doubt? No. Yeah, I think maybe it's, maybe it's like a reasoning doubt. Yeah, it's, like it's, it's a reasoning kind of doubt, all right, okay. Yeah. Right? Okay, so like, yeah, okay, so having your doubts about something, but it encourages you to reason and to then overcome that skepticism, yeah, or maybe... It tends towards the disbelieving, like doesn't it? It tends, it tends to towards the disbelieving skepticism. Right, okay. Than, would, no? Yeah, it's kind yeah, of yeah. withholding. Yeah. It's kind of what? Withholding a little bit. It's withholding, like, right? Yeah. You don't right away go... But, yeah, like it's a general a, sense of being a skeptic about everything. You just generally like... like you can be skeptical about what you don't deny anything. But afflicted skepticism. Right. So would be afflicted would be a problem, but of course, usually we consider it to be a positive quality, right? Yeah, it's something good. Yeah. So here it's just the negative. That's just the negative. So to be skeptical about everything, of course, that could be a bit problematic. Okay. Uh, all right, we'll do that. Seven. Okay. The next, now the, the, you have those five wrong views. And they're quite interesting. Some of them you may not have heard of. Um, the view of the transitory collection. Like, well, you've probably heard that before. It's got a funny name, I know. View of the transitory collection. It's Jitsu Gidawa in Tibetan. Jitsu Gidawa. Jitsu Gidawa means, Dawa means view. Jik means changing. And Tsok means like a aggregation. Right? Like a collection. So actually refers to the five aggregates that are constantly changing, having a wrong view about, in other words, it's saying having a wrong view about our mind and body. So that concerns the self. This is specifically self this is specifically the wrong view that concerns only the self. So we have already talked about ignorance with regard to the self, with regard to phenomena other than the self. But that is specially taken out here because that is much more of a problem, and it's mentioned separately. Okay, and sometimes it's it's just when you hear this word jitsu gitawa, so view of the transitory collection, it's just talking about the misperception of the self and nothing else. But I wouldn't use that word in Tibetan in English because it sounds so weird. View of the transitory collection. But sometimes when His Holiness teaches, the translator may actually use this word because His Holiness says jitsu gitawa. He doesn't talk about danzin. Danzin means the self-grasping mind. Basically the same thing, Tanzin or Jitsu Gitawa. So the view of the transitory collection refers to a mental factor that apprehends an intrinsically existent I and mine. It is an afflictive wisdom. Okay? So what you come across sometimes, the same thing is explained, giving it a different name and explaining it slightly differently. But it's not surprising. It's a synonym, it's a synonym 
or yeah, it's synonymous with another type of mind, which is explained slightly differently. Here it's from the point of view of the basis, mind and body, which are misunderstood. Sometimes it's perishable. Sometimes they call it the perishable collection, yeah. View of the transitory or perishable collection. Maybe perishable is even better. Okay. It's an afflictive wisdom because it function its function is similar to wisdom in the way it actively apprehends its object or an object. However, it is an afflictive wisdom because its object, an intrinsically existent I or mind, does not exist. Also, what is the difference with regard to the transitory view of the transitory collection and just grasping at an I? I can also grasp at the inherent existence of Pianka. Right? If I grasp at the inherent existence of Pianka, that is actually a self-grasping, grasping at herself. Okay? Uh, like the I, her I, grasping at her I versus phenomena other than an I. Okay? But the view of the perishable or transitory collection, that's always regarding their own I. So that's different. There's a difference here. I haven't even stressed that before, but actually there's a way. I look at other people also having, having an inherent I, right? We totally look at other people having an inherently existent I. So sometimes people face this issue when you, for instance, think of the different Dalai Lamas. I don't know whether you've ever read about the previous Dalai Lamas. So the 13th, for instance, the great 13th, as he's called, he was very stern, very serious. And so you may find yourself wondering, how could he be so jolly in this lifetime and so serious and stern in this one? And then each one of them were quite different. So there's a sense there's an I there, like something continues, some personality. So, and if that's not found in each person, we're almost surprised because we assume there is some inherent Dalai Lama-ness that goes on from one life to the next. So how can the Dalai Lama be so different from one life to the next, right? Okay. So again, it just shows that there is no such a self that continues on. That according to circumstances, etc., the mind manifests differently. So in, during the 13th Dalai Lama, I mean, it was also a cultural thing. He manifested differently. Remember I told you when my uncle, when I talked about my uncle? He's actually a nice man. He tries to kind of understand. He's my godfather. We have this whole system of like someone being a special uncle. So there's a special connection, but he's really serious here on Labor Smarts. And... Um, he, he, like his wife talks all the time and he's quiet. His wife is very sweet and loving and he's very quiet. Anyway, so, but he tries to understand, you know, the whole thing. And uh, when I got my Geshe degree, he made me a special card with like, with like something like Abhidharma written on there. Oh, you know, it's like, I said, where did you get that from? He said, I Googled it. He said something about, like, <laughs> Abhidharma, he wrote that on there. It was really sweet, you know. I mean, he's like, and he's an architect, so he's very good with making little things. So he made that card with like little things, like a three-dimensional card, you know, like a, yeah, very special. It was I don't know. Um, he kept asking, you kept it? You kept it? <laughs> I was going to throw it away. I mean, okay. I mean, eventually, you know, after nine years, you throw it away, but I still kept it. I still have it there in case he asks. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the point is that my uncle, when he, when I talk, he always asked me about Buddhism on the phone, right? Not in person, because then his wife's talked, but when I'm... <laughs> But when I'm with him on the phone, it's like a thing. I have to call him when I arrive. Like, right away, he gets offended. So I call him. Hi, how are you? I know his number by heart because for years I have to call him. So I call him, and then we chat, and we talk and stuff. And then he always asks me about Buddhism. Like, I mean, the kind of the, the usual questions. Why are Buddhism? Why do you have to wear this uniform? <laughs> How does it help you, you shave your head, you know? And so anyway, so in, in, initially I said to him, well, you know, like, look at the Dalai Lama. He's so wonderful. He's like, I don't like the man. I'm like, what? And he said, like, he smiles too much. <laughs> And I was like, well, how can that be bad? I said to him, how can that be bad? It's very friendly, very open. And he didn't say anything. And then later on, I thought, when he said that, that was at the time when the, when the Pope was German. Serious, didn't smile. So there is this whole tradition of when, when someone doesn't smile, they're more dignified. You know, like certain people, in certain, like the, the I, I don't think it's necessarily dignified, but you know, there is that sense in, in some cultures also, when a person has a certain position, they no longer smile. 
it's considered to be dignified. So my uncle kind of felt smiling that much. There's something wrong. He's got some agenda. <laughs> I don't know, right? I mean, that's just how the mind works. So during the 13th Dalai Lama, it was just a different period. And so he smiled less. There was no need for it. So my whole point is like, these Dalai Lamas, they're there for our benefit. They manifest in different ways. And the time, I mean, in the, seven, in the, 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 the 21st century, it's holiness, it's, it's openness and, and meeting other people. And, it, and of course, his homeless doesn't always smile. I've seen his homeless very scary. I've seen him very scary. One time during a teaching, boy, it was so scary. Um, it was raining a lot during, uh, the Losa, during Losa, during the New Year period. His homeless used to give two weeks of teachings, morning and afternoon. That's when he was younger. So at that time, it was usually raining. It was really, really cold. There were a few days of warm weather, and then it would rain. And it was one of those days it was raining a lot. I was downstairs with a friend, because upstairs it was totally full. And um, we could see his homeless on the, on the television screen, on the TV screen. And his homeless was teaching, and suddenly he said to one monk, You! Get up! Really, what? <laughs> you? <laughs> I felt like, like everyone felt like, you know, like he's talking to me. Get up! So everyone stopped. And the monk wouldn't get up. And I later heard from other people. So there was a monk who was kind of misbehaving. He was just doing things the whole time and, and not behaving, not paying attention. But that's not usually a reason why his homeless would point at someone and basically tell him to get up. So he wouldn't get up. And so I said, get up, get up. And he didn't get up. And then one of the bodyguards came forward and kind of basically made him get up. And his homeless said, leave, go out. Wow, I've never, ever seen his homeless kick someone out. That was so scary. Total silence. Right? And the story goes, we didn't know what had happened. I mean, he had just been very inattentive and like cracking jokes and it was kind of close to his homeless. But that happens all the time. People nod off, they laugh, they talk to their neighbors. Okay, his homeless doesn't mind, he just continues teaching. And he was from a monastery in South India. Now, the monks heard, and they had some suspicion with, about, of him. So the, the, the fact that his homeless, and his homeless didn't know him, but having pointed him out, and they had some suspicion, because wherever he was, things started disappearing. Okay, Wherever he was, like, things disappeared, someone lost their money, and he was there a little earlier. So they broke open his room, and they found all these things that had gone missing. He had stolen from people. So he was no longer a monk. If you steal from people to such a degree, you break your root vow. So he was no longer a monk. But his homeless, how did he know? Of all the people there, right? So they, they couldn't break his... They had the suspicion before, but there was no reason to break into his room. You have suspicion, you can't just... They don't do that. Usually, unless it's proven, and there's, some, there's more, more reason for it, they don't break into someone's room. But that, the fact he was kicked out, I've never heard of anyone else... Um, for them, that was indicative, or that was enough to open, to break his lock and find all the stuff, money. At that time, it was tape recorders. I don't know. They stole all these things, yeah. And he was, of course, he was not allowed to stay in the monastery. He had to go. It was too much. One or two things they let slide. Let, they usually let it slide. But you did break your vow with this, and that's it. So he was out. Very interesting. So his homeless can be very, very wrathful. And every year, for many years, there used to be an audience. I used to teach a group of um, students from Emory. So we would always have an, an audience with this homeless. And he was very kind, always very kind. But he was also like, okay, next, what's next? Quick, quick, right? With his attendant, because he's very busy. So he's wrathful, wrathful, but it's necessary. And he's kind, when that is necessary. So I can be very wrathful. Or at least strict or stern. All right. Anyway, why am I saying it? Well, first of all, don't believe his home is always uh, has always always manifests manifests in that kind of friendly kind of way. I mean, it's not always necessary. Plus, the previous Dalai Lama was very different. But since there's no intrinsic I, it's not surprising that he may manifest in different ways. Okay. Next is uh, oh yeah. So the reason for calling it the view 
of the transitory collection is that this view apprehends an intrinsically existent I in mind while focusing on the aggregates, which are a transitory collection. The aggregates are a transitory collection due to their impermanent and perishable nature. Okay? So this really means on one's own I. I should have mentioned that. Well, once I, if I do this again, this was a few years ago, so I have to do, make a lot, few changes here. For instance, I didn't mention here that this refers specifically really to one's own I, one's own body and mind. All right. And then view holding to extremes. The view of holding to extreme is an afflictive wisdom focusing on the self as apprehended by the view of the of the view of the as apprehended by the view of the transitory collection, perceiving it either as permanent and non-changing or as subject to annihilation in such a way that it becomes non-existent at the time of death. So out of this misperception, misperception of inherent existence, either as like permanent or it totally goes out of existence afterwards. Because that's the only possibility. If it exists inherently, either it's always there, or at some point it becomes it, it's unchanging during that time, and eventually has to go out of existence. So the sense that I can go totally out of existence because there's inherently existent I. So it can lead to that kind of extreme view, those extreme views. Of course, we talked about extreme views before, and most of our views are extreme, but here they take the two views of, of permanence versus annihilation. Does that make sense? Sometimes the view of permanence refers to the view of inherent existence. Sometimes, as in this example here, it refers to misperceiving the self as inherently existent and, and that being the cause for perceiving the self to be permanent. And we all have that. Right? We all have a view of like a permanent, like not that we think the self doesn't change, but there's a self, the I this morning and the I now is the same. If the I now and the I this morning were the same, if they were identical, by implication you haven't changed. That's why we say it's a view of permanence. Okay. Then, believe in the supremacy of wrong views. Believe in the supremacy of wrong views is an afflictive wisdom that focuses on one of the three views, the, f the view of the transitory collection, the view holding to extreme, or wrong view, which will be explained below, and regards them as supreme. And it could be any wrong view. Sometimes we hold wrong views and hold them to be supreme. Right? We're proud of these wrong views, believing in them, of course, to be correct views. Okay? So a pride is a kind of a pride or a kind of arrogance with regard or a sense of supremacy with regards to certain views. And, and that doesn't give us the openness to maybe reflect upon them. Every now and then, is that a correct view? Have that healthy skepticism to check all my views in accordance with reality. As long as I hold them as supreme, I'll never question them. And again, that's an obstacle. Then, believe in the supremacy of mistaken ethics and religious conduct. Believe in the supremacy. This is another interesting one. And it's just from a Buddhist point of view, of course, you can, of course, uh, of course, you should be skeptical, you, you, you may debate this, but as I said, from a Buddhist point of view. Believe in the supremacy of mistaken ethics and religious conduct is an afflictive wisdom which asserts that various misguided religious practices are supreme and lead towards spiritual attainment. Examples of such practices can be found in many different religious systems. In certain Christian traditions, for instance, one finds the practice of corporal mortification or mortification of the flesh. Is there anyone who doesn't know what that means? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I don't know really much about it. I just read a little bit or like what I've seen in movies, for instance. Like when priests, for instance, like when they have desirous thoughts, they punish themselves, like they whip themselves. They have like a, a whip. And then in, in, in the past, I don't think they do this nowadays, they whip, they still do it? Oh, they still do it. Okay, I just didn't know. Yeah, well, maybe in some places they still do it. Okay, in some countries. So corporate mortification, as if that gets rid of desire, right? You mortify. I mean, you could argue purification is a kind of <laughs> mortification, but here's not the, pur it's not the, the practices themselves, so... When you, when you don't eat, for instance, like when you do nyungne practices, doing a lot of prostrations and not eating, etc. But there's a whole motivation behind it, like using that as a way to purify the mind 
And it's not about mortify, mortification itself. So if it's done with the wish to, right, like if it's, it's done with the uh, with the motivation to purify negativity and etc. But just as a punishment. No, it's the same motivation just to purify. Yeah. No, but I've 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 heard that this is not always the case. It depends on the tradition. Sometimes I've 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 read and. Uh, about this, like a missionary kind of tradition in Germany, they used to do that, and they said it was just to punish yourself. So the moment you noticed that you you had negative thoughts, like especially uh, like when they were celibate and they had like um, thoughts of like a sexual nature, they would just hit themselves. So stop that. And I refer to that. If the motivation is similar, like really to use it as that the mental transformation is the main part. Then I think there's no problem with that. If it's just that, just to mortify. You know, we're going to criticize them, right? Yeah, and even and the Buddha. Here that he used to, to go some, uh, the Buddha went into extremes, into extreme practices which are considered to be inappropriate, yeah. right? The Buddha kind of manifested those extreme, like one was overindulgence and the other one was mortifying the body. So, to to you, you shouldn't, like I said before. Spiritual practice should not be involve uh, physical suffering. A certain degree of discomfort, that's accepted. Of course, it's not always easy to meditate, but you shouldn't deprive yourself of food. You shouldn't engage. There are practices. There are practices when you take a special pill for some time and only take that pill and do special meditational practices. So you, your food intake is restricted. <laughs> <laughs> your food... <laughs> <laughs> Did you do that? No. no. <laughs> they were looking at you. <laughs> so anyway, there are these. Think about drugs. I mean, yeah. Ah. Pardon? All these Buddhists on MDMA. Yeah. <laughs> what is MDMA? <laughs> Ecstasy. Ecstasy. Oh no no. But those are like <laughs> those are like these are like pills made of like certain herbs, like almost like a vitamin pill. So it gives you the most necessary, the most important kind of so that you have all the minerals that you need. And then for some practices that require a very light mind, you don't move much because otherwise you break you know, you need too much energy. And it's said to be very effective, but you you can do it depending on... If you lose too much weight, you can't do it. So you can only do it if you keep healthy and your body doesn't require all this. I mean, also there are, of course, practices where people don't eat, but they take the substances from the environment, right? I mean, also of the great Indian um, yeah. non-Buddhist masters, they've also been able to sustain themselves from... Actually, in theory, that's, that's possible because there's... You know, so much stuff around us. If we can actually take that, we could actually survive. So that has to do with the force of. This has to do with the strength of concentration that a person has. So they don't require the same food. If they talk about the food of concentration, where you get the the necessary whatever you need for the body to survive from the environment through the force of concentration. That, in that case, it's not asceticism. Because you don't lose weight, you don't become very weak, etc. You're not ta- torturing yourself. Your body just doesn't need it. So here we're talking about extreme cases. Okay. Um, so mortification of the flesh, which in some of its more severe forms can mean causing self-inflicted pain and physical harm, such as beating, whipping, piercing, or cutting oneself. Um, being like I don't know, I don't know. I've heard, I hear this again and again. Be, people being beat. I mean being. What do you put that? Crucified, that's right, being crucified. I mean, I don't I don't think it's always something negative if it inspires you to, you know, like with Jesus, what he's done, and just understand the sacrifice, etc. That's different, because he's done it for the benefit of others. But if it's just for the sake to punish yourself, you've done something wrong, or it depends on the motivation. If it's just for the sake of uh, experiencing pain, then that would not help the person to spiritually grow, I believe. It's good, it's like in... Huh? You offer your body but in chur you don't offer your body offer your body only symbolically. Yeah. Well you don't spirit. actually <laughs> <laughs> No, it's just because to 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 when you do chur it's like a practice where you go to a uh, for instance to a cemetery yeah. and you do a practice and you visualize you offer your body. But of course you don't do that. You don't experience pain. And you do it because you're in an environment 
that that is fearful, that triggers fear, like you're in a cemetery at night, you're there at night, and to watch the eye, right? And when the eye comes up, to then offer your body and mind as a practice, but you don't actually torture your body. You don't do that. So I'm just saying in extreme cases, so please don't get me wrong, like when it's not really effective. These practices are considered to help the practitioner to attain a union with God, obtain a higher place in heaven, etc. Similarly, in some religious traditions, one finds the practice of ritual animal sacrifices. That is hugely a problem, and a huge problem. Then there, uh, so in, in Nepal, there's still this tradition. Now it has changed, but um, I, I remember one of my teachers told me um, that everyone sacrifices something. I think now that it's not as... As, as extreme as it used to be, I'm not sure. I think they stopped it's come it. Down, it's come down it's after come down. the king was assassinated. Ah, so after the king was he assassinated. He was hugely into the animal sacrifice. Ah, so I didn't know that. Well, my teacher told me he was once on a plane uh, waiting to fly out of Kathmandu because he had relatives in Kathmandu and they, they just slaughtered a chicken and, and the whole plane was kind of kind of smeared in the, in the chicken blood because that was considered to be... Um, auspicious Barbaric. and, f- and families that had uh, were very rich they would slaughter a bull mm-hmm. like a um, what do you call them the water what? buffalo buffalo oh, they would yeah. uh, uh, offer a water buffalo and those who were poor they would just offer an egg <laughs> <laughs> I think the egg is acceptable <laughs> it wasn't fertilized but the thing is like yeah but I was like my teacher used to talk about the streets of Kathmandu running and blood, I mean, like, been covered in blood. It was terrible. So these animal sacrifices, they're definitely a huge problem. Then there are various ascetic practices, such as standing on one leg or burning the body in the sun for a long time in order to purify negativities. Again, it depends on the motivation, but if it's only done without really wanting to purify, etc., that is not seen as effective. Further, there are numerous cases of self-immolation and ritual suicide that are performed for the sake of spiritual salvation. The view that holds such practices as supreme and as a means of attaining spiritual emancipation is the fourth of the five views. So please, it's only to not misunderstand. I'm saying if it's not done with the right motivation, etc., for instance, giving up your life, killing yourself. Again, from a Buddhist point of view, it's still killing a human being and believing that this gives you spiritual salvation, especially if other people get killed in the process, that's not seen as a spiritual practice. And then wrong view, even though the previous four views are all forms of wrong view, here wrong view refers specifically to an afflictive wisdom that apprehends the non-existence of the law of karma, the non-existence of past and future lives, etc. So previously just an ignorance with regard to those, here a non-existence. I'm not sure what the difference is, like I said. It also refers to the view that asserts the cause of sentient beings and cyclic existence to be a divine creator, a primordial essence, for instance, as propounded by some non-Buddhist Indian philosophical system of the Samgyas, and so forth. So from a Buddhist point of view, they're not accepted. This kind of principal essence from which everything arises, and so forth. All right. I hope it wasn't too boring to read through all those. <laughs> this is the traditional explanation of those. But... Me personally, I get something out of those. Like every time, it gives me the opportunity at least to check which one of those do I hold. Is this something I struggle with? And then there are the secondary afflictions. So the first six I said to be the root because in one way or another, they give rise to the secondary ones. Okay, So the root ones, like I said, you said we, we talk about three poisons, first of all. right? Three poisons of... Uh, attachment, aversion, and ignorance. Ignorance is the root. That gives rise to attachment. That gives rise to aversion. And then the other ones are added to that, um, such as the, the ones we just mentioned. So envy or jealousy. In English, they're used interchangeably sometimes, right? Jealousy and envy. Sometimes they're used inter- interchangeably. We can mean envy, but we can also mean jealousy, right? Both of them would be could be included. Although really in Tibetan it's more envy. In Tibetan the word is more envy. It's less jealousy. Um, so it's actually, jealousy is already it's mentioned here as a secondary one. Did I say envy before or did I say... Oh no, jealousy is not part of them anyway. It's not It's not in the list of those six. So... Um, pardon? It's part of attachment and anger. 
envy is like we, we, are, we resent another person for having something we are attached to. So, okay, anyway, the first one of the 20 secondary afflictions is aggression or belligerence. So it's a mental factor that is an increase of the primary affliction of anger and that wishes to physically or verbally harm others. So it's not just anger, like just feeling angry towards another person, resentful, but it's, it's a stronger form. It's a form of aggression. It's, the other six, they are much more common. This is a little it's slightly uh, less common. We're not often aggressive. I don't think we are. I mean, it, it's a kind of aggression that it, it's inc an increase of the former anger that was mentioned before, and that wishes it wishes it leads to the wish to physically or verbally harm someone, or it actually itself wishes to physically or verbally harm someone. So it basically, it gives rise to physical harm, as in like beating someone or possibly killing someone um, out of anger or insulting them, verbally insulting them. Passive aggressiveness. <laughs> passive aggressiveness. That's an interesting one. What is passive aggressiveness? Anyway. You know, everyone calls it's like every time I ask people what is passive aggressiveness, I get different explanations. Pardon? I mean you are aggressive but you're true. You're trying, you're trying your, to, your best to not show it, I guess. Yeah. And it comes out, or you, you don't, you, you may not try to hide it, but you kind of color it in some words that don't, that, that in and of themselves don't suggest or be aggressiveness. Someone is debating. Just being si just oh, be so if you just keep silence because you don't even respond to what they say, yeah. right? That would be maybe a form of, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, it's almost considered to be rude. Like you're in an argument and coming back and forth, and then suddenly you, you choose to ignore them and, and, and not respond. That would be seen possibly as, a, as an example of being passive, passive aggressive. It's, 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 is that a new thing or has that been around? Right, in a more passive way, so trying to harm them. But you can steal their things without them knowing. You know. Is that <laughs> passive aggressive? If you steal their things? <laughs> I mean, would gossiping? Because gossiping, you don't know. They don't know. Would gossiping be passive aggressive? Because you're trying to harm them without them knowing. <laughs> Spreading rumors about them? That's actually just aggressive. Not actively you, being aggressive. It's trying not to make it show, but it still shows. Trying not to make it show, but it still shows. But then again, ignoring them, that's pretty, you're not trying to, you're not trying to hide it. So you're being sarcastic. A lot of the time when you're passively aggressive, you're, you give like these snidey comments, which are, oh, yeah, which are yeah. not like directed, but like... Uh, uh, then of course, to an extent, potentially you can. So that it's possibly like there's like a two-pronged thing. So you might say something or not say something, which yeah. could be interpreted as, oh, I just don't have anything to say. Mm. But the reason, like the intention and what you're trying to convey with consistency of doing this mm -hmm. is that actually you're targeting a kind of aggression. Like mm -hmm. the example that was given to me was like something that's actually aggressive. It was like, why do you never do the dishes? Why passive what? aggression. Why do you never do the dishes? Yes. Ah. Whereas passive aggression was like, oh, I wish I didn't have to do the dishes all the time. Uh -huh. Or doing the dishes well, really aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Being really loud. So I could just be saying like, oh, I'm fed up with doing the dishes. Like this is just a per like I just am Crazy. just upset about doing this. But I want you to hear. Yeah, you make <laughs> I want you to hear my frustration because mm. I think it's your fault. Okay, now I get it. It's like being annoyed with <laughs> someone at work and then right. like instead of talking to them directly, you like email their boss and copy their name. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow, I'm surprised that you all know so many examples. It's a very British way of doing it. So no one can accuse you of being aggressive because you always say, I just decided not to say anything. Yeah. 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 Yes. 
You've done more than work. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! I, I, I know yes. someone who's very passive aggressive and I have experience. So I think you've like done loads of work nice and they haven't done anything, so you just uh-huh. stop doing work rather than telling them. Oh, right, okay. I don't even think it's at work, I think it's also like. Yeah, yeah. 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 It just becomes very pronounced yeah. in a work environment. It's stupidly evil. It's like. Passive aggressive. Right, little notes. Don't follow treats, yeah, yeah. Oh. No, but right. uh, sometimes writing a note is good because you, you know, my last experience, I write notes sometimes, but not because I'm going to regress, but it depends on the, imp- <laughs> so I guess it depends, so to, to wrap it up, it depends on your motivation, you want to actually harm another person, but you do it through an act that in and of itself, without that motivation, would not be defined as aggressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 That was super technical. You empty. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good definition. I'm used to those definitions, yeah. Because <laughs> okay. the first time I heard it, I was in my... I never heard that before. So someone said, she's very passive-aggressive. And I was like, what does that even mean? Right? I couldn't figure it out. And so over the years, I've figured out what it means. Tibetans don't talk about it. And I'm, I'm definitely, I've been passively aggressive. And I've had other people being passive. I just didn't know there was a word for it until I found out there but was you one. you can be intentionally passively aggressive. You can. Out of pain or something, you... Right. It's just, you're trying... To, I mean, sometimes it's like you practice trying to practice patience, but you're not successful, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they still notice, so... <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Okay, anyway. So maybe we could add that to aggression. Passive aggressive. <laughs> it should be 21 now. <laughs> we could add one. Anyway, those are not exclusive. It's not like they're only those ones. They're other ones, too. Okay. <laughs> then there's... Re- oh, do we need to break, take a break? Should we take a break? Yeah. No, that's okay. Let's take a break then. It's a good time to take a break now. All right. Again, as before, you're welcome to come forward. Oops. Before I forget, a few people have asked me to talk about fear. Uh, say a little bit about fear. Fear is not mentioned much in the text. But I think it's so important to address it. Uh, because we all, especially in the 21st century, all of us, to some degree or another, we experience fear. In the scriptures, they talk about a type of fear that is not necessarily negative. So one type of fear that is mentioned is, before you take refuge, you take refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, and two causes are required. One is fear of the suffering of samsara, of some cycle existence, and the other one is faith in Buddha Dharma Sangha, and especially the Dharma, being able to protect you, protect you by way of you practicing the Dharma, etc. So the type of fear here, it's not seen as something negative, it's a healthy kind of fear. It's a fear based on reasoning. Some people call it just apprehension, like just a form of concern, not like crippling fear. Of course, that would be too extreme. So that has, the, the, has like, a, like I said, a positive type of connotation, like positive yeah, it's seen as something positive. However, there are types of fear that are not seen as positive. They're, they're definitely not positive. So, what are those? Yes, Peter? Fear of what someone else thinks of you. Fear of what someone else thinks of us. Okay. Something. Fear of... What? Of monkeys. Fear of monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's special, that's very specific. That's rational. rational. That's rational fear. Okay, yes. Yes. Fear of the future. Good one. So, fear of being what other people think of us, fear of the future. Yes? I'd say any fear that's based on the misapprehension of reality. Yeah, <laughs> very good. That's clever. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, please. Yes. Fear of death. Fear of death. That's a big a one. Thing, though, right? Fear of death, yes. Great, yes? Uh, fear of situations that induce anxiety. Fear of fear. <laughs> fear of situations that induce anxiety. So fear of fear, basically. Fear of a situation that may lead me to be fearful. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. Fear of fear, that's great. What else? He talks about... Okay, too bad. Uh, fear of the things you don't understand. Like I think of 
cultures. Ah, fear of that, that which you don't know. Right. Yes, please. It kind of ties in with, I think, what you were saying yesterday or the day before about not being able to make decisions. It's like, I, I think, like, in a culture where there are so many, like, choices Options. and possibilities. Mm, possibilities. Oh. I've seen that a lot. There's fear of making the wrong decisions. Making the wrong choice. Yeah, okay. Fear of making the wrong choice. Of the regret. Oh, wow. If I had just not done that, right? Yes, very good. Yes? Fear of projection. Can you explain them? Like, what do you mean? Ex- specific? Fear of projection? What do you mean? Rejection. Rejection. Oh, that, that you don't need to explain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think what, that's similar to what Peter said, like fear of other people, not what other people think of you, and thereafter fear of rejection. Okay, very good. Yes, please? Fear of failure. Yeah. Failure, fear of failure. Good one, very good. Fear of failure. Okay, wow. <laughs> fear of something happens to the people you're closest to. For your, for example, your family. Yes, yes. Fear of change. That's a good one. <laughs> yes, Sam. Fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. Ah, pardon. Oh, it's, like it's, like it's like we don't have a phone, so FOMO. A phone? We missed out on what His Holiness said about yeah. <laughs> There is something that like it's called FOMO? <laughs> FOMO? I thought he said fear of hormones. <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. Ah, oh, very good. Ah, oh, very interesting. Yes, yes, good one. Okay, FOMO. Yes. <laughs> yeah, fear of being out of control, losing control. Losing your mind, like man, um, like. Yeah, going crazy, basically. Going crazy. Yeah, I had this fear. <laughs> Sometimes. Right. I guess we all, to some degree. Wow, this is great, Pian. Yeah. Like fear of water, fear of heights. Ah, uh, fear of heights, fear of spiders. <laughs> Right, Will, William, right? Is it William? Yeah, yeah. Fear of vulnerability. Fear of vulnerability. Oh. Insecurity. Insecurity. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> that should be the first of all those things. Well, it's not an affliction. It's not necessarily creating suffering for us. It's the result of some of the afflictions, but it's not one of the afflictions. It's a negative emotion, such as grief, for instance. All right, great. Okay, very interesting ones. So fear of death, rejection, FOMO, (laughs) 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 of what other people think about us, vulnerability, losing control, of the future. Uh, Oh gosh, there's so many, right? Death. Physical harm. Pardon? Physical harm. Oh yeah, definitely. So actually fear that, to to summarize, fear that something happens to us that we don't want. Right? We don't want. We don't want to be. We don't want to die. We don't want to be rejected. We want our phones. We, want, <laughs> we don't want spiders in our room. We don't want to be up on a right. So anything that could potentially harm us. So what could be the cause of that? Grasping. Oh, of course, it all comes down to the good old self grasping. Right? Okay, so basically it all comes down to that. But it's an interesting. I mean, you can still be less fearful. You can be less fearful. Despite self-grasping. So even if you haven't removed self-grasping, you can, well, you possibly have to reduce that self-cherishing attitude, but also reduce it in other ways. I think fear of the future is very interesting. Fear of the future, because it's something, fear of making the wrong choice, I think is part of this fear of the future. Um, Well, in a way, it's kind of the fear that something could happen that I don't like, but what is worse about the fear of the future, I don't know what's going to happen. So if I at least knew what's going to happen, I only, I'd only be afraid of one situation. But since there are different scenarios, right? One thing could be tomorrow people reject me. Tomorrow I die. Tomorrow I have a spider in my room. Tomorrow my phone is stolen. Tomorrow is, Those are all fears, right? Which lead to the specific types of Suffer or fears that you have mentioned, but it's all lying in the future. And because you don't know which one it is, there is more fear. Because mm-hmm. there are all these options now. Only one can be the case, and still you're scared of all of them. Right? So how to deal with that? Nikita, do you want to add another fear? 
no, I actually wanted to say something. Like, when I did my paratrooping, like, when jumping out of the plane, they said, like, your first jump is always your best jump because it's fear of the unknown. Your second jump is always your worst because it's fear of the known. <laughs> ah, fear of the unknown, fear of the known. That's interesting. And the, the third one? <laughs> you get better at it. Ah, that, that's an interesting, interesting idea. So fear of the unknown, fear of that which you do know. It's gonna ex- you you got to expect. So very interesting fear. And some people are more fearful than others. So, and I think it's so important to remove that fear. And I experienced a lot of fear when I came to India, but I got rid of it now. And in a way, what I definitely feel very strongly about, I've been okay so far, right? When trouble, when there were problems, I've somehow been able to deal with them. So that gives you some confidence that you feel problems may arise, yes, but I can face them, whatever it's going to be. I'll be all right, because I've been all right so far. Does that help a little bit? Of course, there may still be something unexpected, but like my friend the other day, I mean, the worst possible happened to her. And she was able to deal with it so gracefully. She's been such a good example to me uh, how to deal with it. So that also gives me the confidence. And of course, now my practice, taking adversities into the path. Okay, you've heard that. That's called lojong, mind training. We actually embrace difficulties and use them to practice. So it's like you welcome them because without difficulties, you won't be able to deal with them. So I also like fear of rejection. That's also an interesting one. Why is it important that others like me? Why is that important to really go into that? Because, first of all, we're, we're not giving ourselves enough self-confidence. We're not giving ourselves, we expect this from other people. So to recognize, to, to first of all, I think what's very important is to be honest and act with the purest of motivations. That's the first step. Because if we're honest, we don't need to have regrets. We're not deceitful. We don't need to feel about, bad about ourselves. I don't say you don't, I don't mean you have to always tell other people what you think. That's not always skillful. But you're true to yourself in the sense like you don't pretend to be someone who you're not. You try to be a kind person to the best of your ability, but you don't do things so people like you. You do them because it's the right thing to come and get into that habit. And then there is no regret. It's all part of a process. It takes time. But for instance, when you do something good, to also not expect something bad, do it because it's the right thing. Right? And then people will naturally like you. It's a side effect. It's almost like it, it's a side effect. So, but it takes time. It, it, it takes a long time. But it's like a process of learning to accept your own faults for what they are and to be okay with them, to recognize them, to even talk to them about other people it is no problem, to be able to share them with other people, and to learn that there's nothing to protect such. That is, and, and also when you generate love and compassion for other people, then when you deeply care for others, it's more important that you care for others than they care for you. Does that make sense? It's not that important. So this love and compassion, if you generate more love and compassion for others, that sustains you. Even if they don't love you because you love them. It's a little bit like, you know, parents that love their children so much that even though their children sometimes act in a way that is resentful, etc., it's fine. Their love is just kind of embracing them in that way. But that is, it sounds impossible right now. That would really be the end effect at some time. That is difficult to do. So the, the question is how to start, where to start, right? So I don't even know. I mean, it's so, so overwhelming. The sense of rejection is very important, the sense of the future. Okay. So usually in Buddhism, one very effective method to eliminating fear is to take refuge. Take refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And of those, mainly take refuge in the Dharma. 
So what does that mean to take refuge in the Dharma? It's sometimes misunderstood. The Buddha and the, 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 the Sangha are secondary. We don't see them as the main object of refuge. It's just we, because they teach the Dharma, so it's like indirectly we, we kind of entrust ourselves in what the Buddha has said. Or we entrust ourselves in, in, it's really like more than trusting ourselves. Like, have you ever noticed, we take refuge in things all the time. When you're miserable, you eat chocolate. You take refuge in chocolate, right? There's a sense it can give me relief. Or we take refuge in money. Okay, we take refuge in money. As in like, as long as I have a little bit of money, I'm all right. It gives us some security. Or we take refuge in other people, right? Maybe our parents, or our friends, when things go wrong, there's the, the thought, oh, I should call such and such. They can help me. Go for a drink with a friend. Go for a drink with a friend, mm-hmm. yeah. So instead of taking that kind of refuge, you can take that kind of refuge too, but to also go for refuge in the Dharma. What have I learned about the Dharma? What in the Dharma could now help me to deal with this problem? First of all, it's a problem, therefore, it's seen as a method to grow. And that way you embrace the problem as a tool to Dharma practice. Okay, so rejection, for instance, or fear of failure, those are like, like your fear of rejection, fear of failure. So instead of being fearful of them, to say it's okay, because that allows me, right, that allows me to practice patience. Failure will allow me to learn from my mistakes. So even if I fail now, I will learn from those mistakes. And then next time, I'll do better, right? There'll be a next time. Sometimes it's our sense of permanence that although we know there's another time, that seems so far away, right now it's the only thing that's permanent. That's, so my failure will always be with me kind of idea. But of course it just feels like that in that moment and after a day or two, you forget about it. So therefore, to actually think what is the worst thing that can happen? And then to think, that is also okay. I'll deal with it. Bring it on. Mm -hmm. Right? If everyone hates me, as like an example, if everyone hates me, still be okay. That'll be okay. I'll be all right. Right? Okay. And I give my very best. You know, if I work hard and I'm honest and truthful to myself, that'll pass. It cannot be because I would like someone who's like that. I would like them. Why would I reject them? So look at your own perspective with regard to other people. Why would you dislike someone? So to look, take that, that. Or death, take death. Why am I scared of death? Death is just the, the end of one thing and the beginning of something new. In fact, every moment is like that. It's the death of one thing and the beginning of something new. We just have this bizarre way of just focusing on one aspect of it. Right? Each moment is the, the end of one thing and the beginning of something new. Every night you go to sleep is the end of that day. It will never come back. And then, then it's the beginning of something new. Right? So we are fearful of death. Of course, if there's nothing afterwards, why are we scared? There's no one to experience death, so it's not a problem. If there is something afterwards, well, we can prepare for that. And we can prepare, prepare uh, in the right way. So it's the beginning of something new. Okay. Of course, there's the attachment. We have to leave people behind. But the good news is we meet those people again. We actually meet the same people over and over. So we'll meet in a different way. And the people we meet today, we will never meet them in the same way again. Because those people change and we have changed. Right? So really our sense of, like, especially with death or the end of something, we always forget, for us, birth is always a beginning. Well, birth is the end of something else. The person was born, if they're past lives, is the end of their past life. But we just see it as a beginning. We just focus on that. So beginning and end, they're the same thing, just from a different perspective. Right? Whatever is a beginning is also an end. The beginning, so there's an unbroken stream of consciousness, therefore, Every end with regard to one thing is also the beginning of something of something else. So beginning and end are actually like long and short with with relation to this. It's long with relation to that. It's 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 it's, um, short, short, right? So long and short, you find longness and shortness here with regard to this object is both long and short. 
in relation to this is long in relation. So the same is true for death. Death is end of one thing, a beginning of something else. And we now have the opportunity to prepare for our own death, to look forward. So this is why you have people like the great nun Rubina Curtin writing a book, Enjoying Death. <laughs> I love that title. Enjoying Death. <laughs> right? It's a great title. So you absolutely can enjoy your death, right? Therefore, to learn really to embrace even the negative things. Bring it on. To learn that negative situations are actually more beneficial for us than other, than positive ones. If things are always running smoothly for us, if everyone likes us, we won't learn. We need some obnoxious people. <laughs> really, it doesn't feel that way. But the more people, because I can see where my anger still needs some work, only if there's an obnoxious person. So to learn to embrace them, to be grateful to have them. Now, this is not easy. It's very easily said, very hard to do, but not impossible. Right? People do it all the time. Atisha, he took one, one uh, attendant with him to, to Tibet who was really obnoxious, and they told him, don't take him. He, he's constantly criticizing. He said, like, well, everyone pays so much respect to me. No one is going to... Honestly, if everyone is respectful towards you, that's a problem. Right? That's a problem, too. So we think, like, is it, it, what is the option? You know, no one rejects you. Everyone thinks you're great. That's also a problem. Spiritually, you won't evolve. So it's good that some people reject you. Okay? It's good some people don't like you. It's good that we die one day. Because we're just going older and older and older and older and older and older and older. <laughs> I mean, right? People who live to a very high age, this is all their whole life. Really, I was thinking, like, if someone gets to, like, 110, their whole life they were old, basically. Right? I mean, okay, we may say 50 is not old, depending on how old you are. If you're 20, you think it's old. If you're 50, you think it's young. So never mind. But in, in general terms, we do say, you know, 40, 50. I don't consider myself young. I'm no longer young. <laughs> right? I'm old. It's okay. It's fine. I don't think I want to go back to being a teenager anyway. <laughs> so I don't miss any time. I make lots of mistakes, and I don't miss that. So being old is fine, but like, then, then when it starts getting, you know, I mean, now I have these aches, and you know, I get up in, in the morning, I'm like, oh, I didn't have that when I was like 20, 30, you know, it didn't happen. Now I have that. That's part of getting old. So death is actually good. At some point, you get a new body. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? You can do these crazy things with your legs and your arms that you can no longer do. You know, like these wheel things. I could do them. I did them the other day at home. I almost died. You know? <laughs> First of all, I tumbled. Like, I can't do these things. I tried to skip rope. You know, my nieces and nephews, they're good at that. I could do two and then I almost collapsed. So it's like my body is really not what it used to be. So the point is, so many things we're fearful of, if we really think about them, they're not so bad. Right? If everyone rejects you, you have more time to do other things. No need to call people all the time. <laughs> right? If no one likes you, finally can go into retreat because no one's going to be on your face. <laughs> right? What else? Um, failure? Well, again, you learn from it. What other fears did we mention? Fear of Run the explanation about fear that something will happen to your children. <sighs> I don't have children, right? If something could happen to you. Wow, that must be like the worst pain. I cannot imagine that. So something happens to your children. But usually nothing happens to your children, right? <laughs> I mean, most parents I know, they didn't lose a child. And then when you deal with it, when it happens, it's, it's not even, right? I mean, of course, you should be careful. You should warn your children, educate them. Don't go with the wrong people when they're very young or make sure, etc. So that fear, of course, is there. But when it becomes de debilitating, then there's something. Of course, a healthy amount of fear is good. I mean, fear, height of, fears of height, fear of heights, that's actually a good thing, I'd say, because it protects you. So certain fears are okay, but when they become, like I say, debilitating, then it's a problem. So to recognize the fear, to embrace the fear, because otherwise, as M says, you have the fear of, the, of fear. Fear of fear is because we don't allow for the fear. And then when it's there, when your fear is there, 
to then check what am I really scared of and then allow the possibility that actually happens and see that there, it can every disadvantage has an advantage everyone right i love that saying when life gives you lemons make lemonade it's great this is really profound this is very profound so whatever happens you turn it around sometimes the most special people are the people who went through a lot of adversity they grew stronger, they changed things around. Parents of children who were murdered, oftentimes they start support groups, they start things and they start something new. They help a lot of other children, they help a lot of other mothers not to experience that. So, I don't, I don't, it's very unlikely that this happens, but even if it happens, we will cope, <coughs> we will do something. And even if your child dies, if there's rebirth, there'll be someone else's child as everyone else has be your child. Also, our attachment to our children is very interesting. Being attached to just, this is my child. But actually, if you start thinking, everyone has been your child. Everyone has been your child. You've all been my children. <laughs> right? So I say this to some mothers and they go, no. <laughs> no. Right? There's this no. It's like, no, this is truly and inherently my child. But if there's reincarnation, I don't think you've had the same child all the time. It doesn't make sense, right? I mean, when they die, when you die, right, then you're reborn before. Okay, then you could be their parent again. That's yeah. actually. Or if they die before, no way. They can be your parent, right? If they die before you, which hopefully doesn't happen. But you see, like, any situation, we can grow from it. So if you learn that, then no matter what happens, you see it in a spiritual way, and it's not unrealistic. You'll deal with it. You'll grow from it. Does that make sense? Does that help a little bit with fear? And what about insecurities? Are the same as fear? Or? Insecurity. That's a very interesting one. Insecurity in what situation? What do you mean? Like not feeling complete. Ah, okay. So I have an insecurity. I can talk to all of you when it's about the Dharma. But I notice when we're more than five people, I can no longer talk. If it's just about other stuff, I cannot talk. I'm too shy. Right? It's really funny. There's a certain... The other day I was thinking, how many is it exactly? Three, I'm okay. Four, I'm okay. I think it's five. <laughs> so, right, we were just talking. I don't know you. You come into a room. Everyone's chatting. I cannot say something. I feel insecure. I feel shy. And it doesn't bother me. I just wait until one or two people leave and then I'm all right. <laughs> it doesn't bother me. I just, you know, it's just what I am. It's like I'm shy. So in, I can do this here, but that's just the Dharma. The moment I talk about other things and I try to make you laugh, you will you feel, think my, my jokes are the worst. If I try, it cannot. It just doesn't work. So as I'm, I'm trying to say, that's a kind of insecurity. Now feeling incomplete, that is different. I'm trying to think. Feeling incomplete. In what way? That if I don't have certain things, that I don't feel incomplete and I have... Ah, material things? things? Yeah, or anything else. Or material things? Feeling. Material thing that's kind of easy, right? In a way, kind of relatively easy. If I don't have a car, how am, am I incomplete? Right? I have to take the bus. Okay. But... Okay, so material Not things... Not being a part of a group or like sort of a fear of isolation... But that is just created by the mind. Really, like, that is just a total creation. If you're part of the group, you'll not be happier anyway. You'll be happy for a day or two, and then worse off, right? We wish for something. People that wish to win the lottery, and then they win. If you ask them after 10 years, they're happier? No. They're not happier. Okay. Well, maybe if there was a huge problem that they couldn't solve before, and now they can't. Not maybe, but usually no. These external things, they give us a sense of happiness for a while. You know, I think it was Jetsu Maten Zampamo who talked about it. She said once, with, da, with, with every person there is, there's a certain degree of well-being. Okay? It's a certain level of well-being. So for some people, that level is lower. That it's, you don't feel that satisfied. You're kind of like, it's kind of a lower level. And some people are more satisfied. So this level... This constant level, sometimes other things happen and it goes down, but before you know, it goes up again. No matter what problem you have. If it's a problem today, tomorrow it already feels different. Likewise, something great happens. 
it goes up briefly and it comes down to that normal level again. Can anyone, everyone identify with that? That there's a normal level of happiness. But that these psychologists that described that, they said if you engage in Dharma practice, in particular with Dharma practice, the level goes higher. Mm -hmm. That level of being okay with things, being satisfied. You still have like a, a, an even higher high and a low, you have lower points, but you also learn very quickly to come back up. You, you're quicker to come back up. You don't fall into a hole because you know the impermanence. You know it's not as real. It's not as, it's, it seems very solid, but it isn't. You go down and you come up very quickly. And you have a goal. He's Pardon? Really, having a goal really helps. Having a goal. Yeah. Okay, having a goal. Right. Yeah, that definitely helps. Absolutely. But the point is you go, even like great happiness, you let it go. Okay, it's nice. It's exciting. But it's already changing. Go back to the... Overexcitement is also a problem. Okay, things are nicely now, but they'll change again, right? Someone tells me I'm the special person, but that'll take off. They've changed their mind. That's going on. I mean, it doesn't matter what people tell us. It doesn't matter if they think we're great. If I have faults, they just don't see me for who we are, right? If people think I'm really amazing. I'm sometimes thinking these really famous people, they must feel so lonely because no one knows who they really are. They don't see their faults. They want to rub shoulders with them because they're famous. They feel they get something from that. They get a little bit of fame themselves. Plus, they can't, they see them as so great and as so wonderful, right? And don't see their faults. I mean, the one thing that I learned, when you meet other people, they're like everyone else. Even if they're famous or not, if you talk to them, they're just as insecure as we all are. So, except for the great lamas. And then, of course, it's different. We can learn from them, we're inspired by them, and we don't have to be in their presence. We just practice what they tell us to do, and that's it. Right? But in, in, the same, but in the case of uh, insecurity, when you feel complete, immediately, if you're not going to be a lama and a monk in practice, there is a, there's a reason there's a man and a woman. So the masculine-feminine merger or attraction exists for mm -hmm. a reason. So in that case, if a person feels incomplete without having... A partner? Well, just find a partner. Half of the world. Is a <laughs> right? I mean, how different was that? <laughs> I mean, if you need a special partner and you have to be this and that, and you really like, then you may have a problem well, because you may not find. Uh, even after finding a partner, the securities don't go away. Exactly. Then finding a partner. <laughs> now you have to deal with your own and that partner's insecurities. Thank you very much. <laughs> Right? So really, I mean, it's great to have a partner and all that. But to don't, don't expect that person to solve your problems. They come with their own package of problems. <laughs> right? Does that make sense? Yeah, to an extent, it's also society which tells you you always have That's, to. Yeah. That is so good. That's such a good... Really check. I mean, honestly, tell me about pressure. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm a freak. In my family, I'm the freak. In, right, you too, you too, yeah, you guys, you know, we're all freaks, right? The thing is, like, when I first became a nun, oh my god, the whole neighborhood was engaging in psychoanalysis of what my parents would probably did wrong, what could it have been, you know? Right? I mean, like, yeah. So the thing is, like, okay, they just don't know better, right? They just don't, I mean, it's, and oftentimes it's a fear, too. They fear as in like, or like the unknown, and maybe also a little bit of like envy. They've just taken that step. They have this freedom. I don't have the free. So almost like to tell you, no, this is not the right thing, because they can't bear see, seeing someone who's actually left the mold and did something different. And to tell you the truth, I just recently met my classmates from before, from high school. It's so bizarre. I haven't met them for years. And when I first became a nun, it was like, ugh, poor thing, you know, that's so odd. How did she go off, you know? What drugs did she take and all that, right? The usual thing. And then they all got married and they had kids, you know. And we met recently. Most of them are now divorced. The kids have grown up, right? And they're like, ugh. Well, kind of like now they're if they're not admitting, at least they're like saying like, wow. So what you've done, that's kind of like, wow, you've really gotten out or something. So it's sooner or later they come around. 
the moment the midlife crisis starts, you know they grow older, they're like, oh yeah, it's right there, right? It's right there. So just wait a few years. <laughs> right? It's seriously, I mean, at some point, people, at like once you reach 40, 50, 60, around that age, I think people start looking back and they realize they work so hard and it's no longer going up. Right? Now other people get their jobs. Now other people are more beautiful. Other people get your husband or your wife, right? <laughs> other people marry your children, right? And they're now, the, now you were at the center of the universe of your son and your daughter. Now someone else is the center of the universe of your son and daughter, right? So, yeah, that's old age. It's not just the physical, it's everything else. So therefore, the Dharma really helps us to deal with it, to embrace it. It's okay to be old. Who cares? Right? It's something new. You learn something else. So you let go of this attachment to people. I still have my family. I am attached to my mom and to my dad. But I also, any moment, I expect they're more than 80. I know they'll be gone one day. And I'll have to say goodbye. It is, that's part of life. Okay. So in that way, I think we can deal with these insecurities, with these fears, to just expect them, to embrace them from the beginning. It's okay. It's fine. It's samsara. Let's not find lasting. Let's not try to find lasting happiness in samsara. That's like trying to find dry water. That's like trying to find cold fire. You won't find cold fire. You won't find a samsara situation that is totally in the nature of suffering. Uh, happiness. <laughs> right? Okay, so as long as we say, okay, I'm samsara, that's okay, I have this mind, because I have this mind that has misperceived reality, therefore I'm in samsara. It's to be expected, it's part of it. All right, and then it's okay, whatever suffering, it's okay, it's part of it. So I hope that helps a little bit with fear. Uh, you want to say something, yeah? Just, it's a thought that, is fear a result of lack of self-reflection because people block their thoughts, what they're fearful of? <sighs> I think it's not as simple as that, but that is part of it. Not reflecting en enough about what you can do, what you can actually deal with, what you've dealt with so far. Uh, lack of self-reflection in the sense of how the self really well, exists. Fear, yeah. uh, lack because of understanding of, of reality. Pardon? I'm saying they're afraid of thinking about it, so they block their thought about that. Ah, okay, so fear of fear, basically. Or fear, or not wanting to deal with it, of like the situation no. blocking that. Suppose you're that. afraid of heights. Mm -hmm. So you will not even try, you block your thoughts about going somewhere which is high. Right, so and you're trying to avoid whatever thing you're afraid of. You don't try to even imagine it. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Well, that's what I'm saying. Imagine it. <laughs> imagine it. What was the worst that can happen? Right? And then you realize it's not so bad after all. I can deal with that. Okay? You can... Be on a high mountain and hold, or have someone else hold you, you know. I mean, those are different kinds of fear. They're more like, uh, yeah, I mean, they're le less created by the mind. They're more, they're harder to deal with. But yeah, I think you can also deal with them. And maybe just don't climb up a mountain. Why would you? <laughs> <laughs> don't have to, right? Uh, yes. Um, there's this uh, author who talks about fear. Uh, who's, this? who's this? Uh, who's this? Uh, Elizabeth Gilbert. Elvis Biz Elizabeth 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 Gilbert. Gilbert. Could you write it later on the on the whiteboard? Yes, please. Because then people may be interested in that. So what is what about yeah, she gives a she, good analogy. She said uh, also she says that everyone is fearful. Um, and fear is good. It's the thing that stops you from crossing the road when you're mm. you know, being hit kind of. So it's important to us. But when it takes over, like mm. it stops you from doing things, mm -hmm. then it's um, then it's not good. So the way to deal with it, she says, <laughs> it, uh, she says it, in a way, like if you uh, imagine if you're going on a trip, like uh, and she basically talks in pursuit of creativity or a project that you pursue or something. So she's like, so uh, creativity is allowed to sit on the front seat, um, front seat with you. And, but take fear along. Let her, let it be in the back seat, mm -hmm. and let her know that she's not in charge of the map mm -hmm. or the music. <laughs> <laughs> not in charge of the map or the music. Cre yeah, okay. Creativity. You're allowed to be there, but just like ah, be there. okay, okay, okay. Is that's an interesting idea. So to see fear 
not to be fearful of fear because fear can be helpful like even in buddhism they talk about as one of the causes to take refuge so it's necessary a healthy amount of fear of course to stay alive and your life is precious but to not allow that fear to control you she also mm -hmm. adds that um, uh, the only people who are not fearful are uh, childish mm -hmm. or children mm -hmm. so to say like very young or mm -hmm. uh, neurotic Mm -hmm. So fear is important. It's an important ingredient of the self. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a certain degree of fear. Of course, I mean, from a Buddhist point of view, once you're highly evolved, but that's different. Right? We're talking about ordinary people. Okay. Maybe that's helpful. So I can say, I say in Buddhism, you don't really find a lot of explanation because probably Tibetans and Indians at the time didn't face that kind of fear. So it's just not mentioned, but it's somewhere it's in there too so there are solutions to that of course and it's a very very important it's very much i think fear is instilled in us i think insurance companies they thrive on that yeah. Yeah. i seriously right and i remember watching this documentary fahrenheit 9 11 no it was not called it was bowling at columbine or maybe fahrenheit 11 how in the u.s for instance um the the news They try to instill fear in people. And this is also now the case in other uh, cases. So, for instance, he gives the example of this. There's a snake in Florida. It went into people's homes. They just throw this as part of, like, make it like a huge drama as if the snake is ever-present in everyone's home now. So, like, it probably gets people so fearful. And a lot of young people, I remember every year with the Emory students, so they would be, they would have to talk about, I mean, they would have to uh, let people know, the res people responsible, what medication they were on. And many of them were on anxiety medication. Mm -hmm. So much anxiety, right? So much anxiety of the pressure in this world and not living up to the pressure, needing to be someone and, and not being able to live up to that. That is so artificial. It's society wanting to basically create being better and better and better and eventually you can live up to it but when you're on the top of the mountain you look up it's overwhelming so the sense of like i have to be this person and just that fear cripples them and paralyzes them so that is something very scary we really need especially with young people to find means and this is where his home is the dalai lama for instance his initiative to bring the dharma into schools but it doesn't mean bring Buddhism as such, bring aspects such as mindfulness. There's like a whole movement now to, to bring love and compassion and care for others into the schools. And they, they, I read about this just recently. There's a book on it. I forget now, of course, what it is. It was like a year ago when I read about it, about this project where they went to schools where children, especially children of uh, disadvantaged backgrounds, like they, they focused on those schools. And they introduced ideas such as putting yourself into the other person's shoe and kind of really actively allow these children to, symp to, to, to sympathize with other children, to create, I mean, to um, practice empathy and so forth. And I don't remember exactly, but these children were saying it changed their life. It changed their life. Suddenly they no longer felt uh, lonely because it was not just their problems, they realized everyone else had, and they reached out and... It was, it was so profound. I mean, it moved me to tears to read how a simple technique could get rid of so much anxiety and loneliness and feelings of isolation. So I can, I really get this. Holmes started talking about this like 30 years ago when people were like, what? But Holmes is oftentimes, he, he kind of has a sense of what's going to happen in the future. And then when things are getting really bad, It's already started to, to get into it and people are, are there to act. So there are a lot of projects now bringing ideas such as mindfulness in Indian schools. I know in Indian schools it's been very strong because India has been very open. The Indian government has been very open to these ideas. It's been introduced to a lot of Indian schools, meditation, etc., which in is second nature in to Delhi. Indians. In the Delhi government, His Holiness has implemented the happiness curriculum. The yes. happiness curriculum. Yes. Oh, I love and the name. And teachers and parents have already, within one year, two uh -huh. years, yes. have reported how the whole mindset of children have changed, the environment have changed. Beautiful. I visited schools before and after, mm -hmm. and physically the school looks different. Wow, how beautiful. So please all remember, happiness curriculum. Maybe you can bring that in one way or another back to your 
and recently he uh, launched the world's launch of the social e emotional ethical curriculum was done social emotional secular emotional ethical emotional learning learning okay launched in 17 languages in 17 languages 17. Wow. and Rodinus wants it to reach every child Oh, that is so beautiful. That's so beautiful, Bao. You wanted to say something? I, I, sh I mentioned to you that inspired by this very same thing, yes. I took the initiative to introduce uh, a course on happiness in my university. Uh -huh. So it is under process now. Beautiful. This is great. So India is basically leading this because it's really part of Indian culture, so it's much easier. It comes really natural. And then becoming an example, hopefully to other children. That's so beautiful. That's so amazing. It's so heartwarming. Because those are of course the beings, the humans of this I mean the, the adults of the future. And we have to start with children. That's amazing. Okay, great. All right, should we go on a little bit? A yeah. question about aggression. Question about aggression? Okay. Yes, how so, yeah. Can aggression be a good thing in um, cases such as sports? Sports. Sports. Can it be good in sports? Aggression, yeah. But it's, not, it's not based on anger, though. It's no, okay, so that, that's an important point. That's really, really interesting. I, I, I'm thinking of this a lot because sometimes, you know, like when there's an injustice. I'm not talking about sports here. I'm talking about an injustice. I don't know whether I, I remember this correctly, but I remember years ago I read the life story of Indira Gandhi. And I thought I read somewhere that at some point she witnessed a crowd following following someone and setting out to kill this person or something. And she put herself in front of the crowd and kind of said, stop it. I think that was in Jerry Gandhi. I'm not sure. Anyway, so it's definitely happened in other cases. So, and I remember reading this person saying, I was so angry with what they did to this child. But it wasn't anger with the people. It was anger with the injustice. And his homeless talks about this in his book, uh, Beyond Religion. He says, actually, anger against, anger with an injustice is not the kind of anger or aggression that is a problem. It's not really harming. So it's a sense of like, this is not okay. I need to do something. That is important to act. I think it's beautiful when you witness an injustice and usually would never face other people, never face a crowd. So when we talk about courage, in that moment you feel like, this is not okay. This is not just, I need to make it right. And you have the power, you have the strength, you have the determination and courage to face it. I think that's beautiful. And you're not hating anyone. There's no aggression. You don't want to insult someone. You don't want to. You just want to set it right. That is acceptable. Now, this is a beautiful aspect about sport. Hmm. What is your motivation? You want to win? You want the others to lose? Hmm. Okay. So your motivation is probably not the purest. Um, but then again, you know, it's like as part of the game, just being physically aggressive, we're talking about just mental states. You don't want to harm them. You just want to get the ball. And what about aggression in groups in World War II? In aggression in groups? In groups in World War II. What do you do? The soldiers who were fighting against Nazi Germany and their aggression. Soldiers, very, very complicated. That's a difficult one on, on war. You know that monks that monks are allowed. To, nuns don't have that, but monks can give back their vows and take them back. I think seven times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nuns cannot. Why? Why? Because at the time of the Buddha, they by decree had to sometimes go off and fight a war, and if it was the, 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 such was the custom at the time, the women didn't have to go to war. The man had to go to war, and if they didn't go to war, maybe they were killed or their families weren't killed. So the Buddha made room for that. So he basically said, you have to leave, you have to give up your ropes, and you have to go into war. At that time, they didn't have weapons like, such as guns. So you could just kind of secretly fire in the sky. You actually had to, you know, and you had to kill people. I mean, it's terrible. You may have to kill people. It would be like your whole family be killed or you be killed. I mean, some pacifists will maybe refuse but it could also mean your country be overrun and you cannot practice the Dharma. It could mean that, right? You'd have the, the freedom to practice the Dharma. So in Buddhism, Buddhism is not totally against war. His Holiness has said it once, 
Wow, that was a powerful audience. That was also one of those with the Emory students. They were also very actively politically. So they asked about why His Holiness was against nonviolence in Tibet. Like that was it was during that time when the Tibet, a lot of Tibetans it was 2000 around 2008. There were these peace marches and they were all going uh, like a lot of Tibetans saying, "Let's go to Tibet. Let's you know fight and so forth." So His Holiness said something very interesting that I haven't heard in said in public much and it's fine to say it because it's i don't think it was a secret so as holmes at that time said um i'm not against war i'm not against aggression when we say non-violence we're talking about a mental state and it depends on one's motivation if for instance it were possible theoretically that we go to tibet with a, with an army of soldiers and within one or two battles, we move the Chinese, they go back to their country, we can continue with practicing our religion and our culture, fine. Okay? Short-term harm, long-term benefit. It's okay. He says, I'm not totally against war, but... And then he gave the scenario. Now imagine Tibetans fight against the Chinese. What are you going to go? How are you going to get weapons? secretly going into Afghanistan and get like 15 guns or maybe 150 if you're lucky. How are you going to get in? How are you going to get the guns out? And okay, now say you have 150 guns, even a thousand guns. Now you need to find Tibetans who can shoot, right? And then you have a thousand soldiers, even a million, I mean, even 10,000 soldiers. How many soldiers do the Chinese have? It's ridiculous. Like, violence is not going to work because you you're just going to create more suffering and you can't solve the situation in a, in a short battle. No, all these 10,000 Tibetans, they're going to get killed, all of them. And that's it, end of story. So what was the point? Just getting the weapons, such an effort. So he just describes how you kind of sneak into a country and get the weapon. Even that was hilarious. It was true. How, it's not like you buy them at Amazon or something. You know? <laughs> Prime, Amazon yeah, Prime, yeah, five weapons. <laughs> oh, go to, oh, you have to go to Walmart in the US. But then you can't get them out. <laughs> how do you get them from the US? Okay, you can get weapons in the US, but you can't get them to Tibet. You see? So it's just not realistic. Therefore, Tibetans are not, I mean, in Buddhism, it's not like war is always a no-no. So, therefore, sometimes monks had to fight in wars in his home, and, and the Buddha himself gave that option that you can basically seven times. It, it was probably, it happened so frequently, and that's not in the sutras. That, that's ever one hurt, once hurt when the monks were fighting a war. There's no sutra that starts that way. But it happened, because otherwise you wouldn't have that special rule. Mm -hmm. And women didn't have to fight. They didn't have to go to war. It just wasn't it wasn't customary. So you had to sometimes be aggressive for a long-term benefit. And that is terrible. It is terrible. But living in samsara, even having this body, I mean, all the insects, not the insects, all the bugs that live in your body, I mean, you survive and many of them die. Right? I mean, the fact that we keep alive, even if you're vegetarian, I mean, one thing of cauliflower depending on how many worms are in there, you know, one meal means you kill a lot of worms. Okay? So really, even being a vegetarian, you can't avoid it. You'll kill all insects, etc. It's just part of life. But that's why it's so important to live a meaningful life. Otherwise, the death of those broccoli, no, what is it? Cauliflower worms was for nothing. But if your motivation is positive, if your motivation is, right? I mean, it's not like that you, you don't, you don't, accumulate the karma of killing but still you are responsible for the death you know if you pick it up yourself and then what are you going to do with it right what are you going to do with it find another cauliflower and put it on there <laughs> i mean or i don't know sometimes we kill it inadvertently so it happens all the time therefore to generate a positive motivation and still possibly sometimes we have to engage in these actions right if you have to go to war i hope it doesn't happen uh, but who knows Yes. And the motivation is most important. Okay. Oh, there's one more thing here. I'm keeping the vows and promises, day-to-day -day commitments. What is the Buddhist view? Are you taking the vows tomorrow? Yes. Have you already talked about them? Uh, a little bit. A little I, bit. I just assume most people know what they are, but you can certainly talk some more. Just a little bit. This one, one thing. Keeping a vow or keeping a promise, it is more forceful 
than just refraining from an action. So there's a very uh, interesting idea of how the mind works. It's like, if you don't kill, all of us engage in the act of not killing. This is very virtuous right now as you're here. Of course, you probably don't kill in everyday life anyway, but here, very concentrated, you pay attention. I can tell you, I can see all these insects being very gently being carried outside. So you're very careful to not kill, not even an insect. But if you make the promise not to do that, then it has even more because you, it has a, it's something how the mind works. The virtue is even greater if you make that promise and then keep it. So there's stories in the past of someone who was a butcher and killed throughout the day. He couldn't do anything that was kept his family alive. He couldn't get out of it. And he asked the Buddha what he could do. And the Buddha said, well, take a vow that at night you won't kill, and only throughout the day. So he wasn't killing at night anyway. He was sleeping. But that was considered, to, that, that, that created a lot of virtue in his mind that helped him to avoid certain sufferings. So if you make a promise, it's a little bit like a marriage vow. I mean, sometimes people take a marriage vow because it helps them to be more faithful. It's not true for everyone, but it helps them to be even more faithful, right? I didn't mean it that way, but yeah, I can see now how it's funny, <laughs> right? No, I know why you, why you laugh. But anyway, the point is, I was thinking of it differently, but for some people that's just not the case. It doesn't make it stronger. But usually if you take a vow, if you make a promise, the ver it helps you to keep a certain promise stronger, more mindfully, and it makes it that much virtuous. But even just taking the promise, making the vow in general, even if you're not so mindful, there's virtue in that. That's why we take the one-day vow. Okay? The one-day vow is said to be very, very virtuous. So especially with the motivation to benefit others. It's just for your own mind. Although you may refrain from killing anyway, but making that promise, there's extra virtue with that. What does right. that have to do with not eating? Pardon? I said, like, what are the precepts have to do with not eating? Oh, with not eating. Well, a lot of our attachment has to do with food. So if that day we are already thinking, okay, I'm not going to eat that much, we can actually maybe for one day loosen that attachment because it's just not an option. So after whatever, lunch, food, I mean, you may be thinking more about food. That could be a problem, but that's usually only when you take the precepts for the first time. The second or third time, it's already okay. Food is not an option. You don't even think about it, right? It's in our case, for instance, we have the vow of celibacy, so we don't think of men. I mean, if you think of men, you have a problem, okay, because you have a vow. So either you give back the vow or you just don't even think about it. And then it's out of your mind and you have more freedom within that. Okay? I don't need to plan my next hairdresser appointment. Perm, <laughs> no perm, red, orange, whichever color, don't need to. Right? No, no, I don't have to make that choice. If I don't eat after lunch, I don't have to think about what vegetable I'm going to get. Is it going to be organic, whatever? I'm not eating. So I have that freedom in my mind. I have that freedom with regard to that. So this attachment for right now, and that gives me the space to do other things. Does that help? Does that make sense with the food, for instance? But of course, if you're totally obsessed about food, you might as well just eat. <laughs> this is like our daily life. It's just like you get up in the morning, you're like, today I'm not going to kill anything for 24 hours. Yes, that's a, if you make that promise for the benefit of all sentient beings, I will not kill. That is said to be very virtuous. But we don't take the time to do that. You may actually take a lifelong vow. Or if you don't want to take a lifelong vow, you take it for yourself. Make that promise. It's not called a vow, but you make that promise for a month or for a week, however long you can take it. That's said to be very Does effective. Does it matter if you like if you're not vegetarian? It doesn't. I mean, it's better to be a vegetarian because, of course, it, it, you don't live in Tibet at like an altitude of 5,000 meters and the only thing that keeps you alive is meat, so no excuses. Um, we live at a time and age where we don't need to eat meat. Meat has been allowed for a lot of Buddhists because a lot of monks and nuns were begging for food and they were supposed to accept everything, anything, because some people couldn't offer more than meat. But that's different for us. So no excuses. And living in India, there are a lot of possibilities to not eat meat. And look at the meat production in this world and look at the environmental effects it has, how animals are tortured for our consumption. Good reason to be a meat eater. Not a meat eater. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I just wanted to deal with that non-vegetarian question very quickly. So I just... Cited the quick reason. I mean, you all get what I'm saying, right? But I want to go back a little bit to the text. So thank you for saying that. Sure. Of yeah, course. Yeah, all right. We 
Resentment is the next mental factor. It's a mental factor that maintains the continuum of the primary affliction of anger without forgetting it and wants to retaliate. Okay, so wanting to retaliate, the sense of resentment. It's not anger as such, it's not aggression, it's just that kind of wanting to get back at the past, wanting to retaliate. Concealment, or sometimes it's called denial. Concealment is a mental factor that is a type of ignorance which wants to conceal our faults from others when they're pointed out by someone with the motivation to benefit. So it's out of attachment. We try to conceal a fault, even though it's pointed out by someone to help us, to benefit us. Okay? So nonetheless, we try to pretend we're someone else, and that's said to be um, an affliction. Spite. Spite is a mental factor that is a type of anger, which motivated by the secondary afflictions of aggression and resentment, wants to speak harshly. Okay? Spite. So this again is a funny kind of word, maybe, but we don't really have words for that in English. But being spiteful, like wanting to, it, it's like the motivation that that is that motivating force that makes us that is responsible for us insulting others or speaking harshly. Mm -hmm. Jealousy. Jealousy is a mental factor that is a type of anger which motivated by attachment to material possessions. This really is kind of like it's, it's really a title, as in like envy status, etc., cannot bear and feels resentful towards others' accomplishments. So jealousy with another person, like jealousy when we're jealous, but we also have resentment towards the person that our partner is with. If we have a partner, we're jealous of them, like being with another person. So we resent the other person for being with the person we're attached to. Does that make sense? Does that sound about right? We resent someone else. Yeah. So... Here it's not with material possessions, but it's another person. Miserliness. Miserliness is a mental factor that is a type of attachment which, motivated by attachment to material possessions, status, etc., holds on to things tightly and does not want to separate from them. Okay? We all know what miserliness is. I'm pretty sure that miserliness is the definition for jealousy, and jealousy is envy. So jealousy is not wanting to lose something that you have. Yeah. Envy is wanting something that something that somebody else has. No? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't hold, but miserliness holds onto things tightly and does not want to separate from them. That's yeah. miserliness, right? That's jealousy, you're saying? If so, well, not one, so the jealousy thing, like you feel jealous of someone because you don't want to lose your partner. You're afraid of losing, so you hold, you hold it. Maybe envy is a better word. Envy is what envy you someone else has. Right. So, if you, if you say envy, because it's really envy. Yeah. Sometimes envy and jealousy are used interchangeably, right? You say, like, oh, I'm so jealous of my neighbor's car, right? Sometimes it's used interchangeably. Um, while if you're jealous when your partner is with someone else, you wouldn't say envy, right? But here it's specifically envy. So, if we say envy is a mental factor, it's a type of anger, type of resentment, motivated by attachment to material possession, status, etc., and cannot bear and feels resentful towards others, like others having the thing that I want. That works better, right? So then I'd call it, yeah, I'd say envy, okay? And miserliness is a, similarly, you can't, you, you hold on to, you. well, there's no resentment as such. Uh, there's just holding on to something that you attach to and you can't let it go. Right? Like, you don't want to offer it. Like, if you want it, like, if someone asks you for money, yeah, 10 rupees I can give, 100 rupees, oh, can't give. That would be my this. And, of course, I'm not saying, like, you should give away everything. That would be stupid. <laughs> I mean, right? If you give away everything and you starve, but that's not a good idea. But I said to you in the beginning, one way to deal with, like, the, like to, in a Dharma way, to offer your possessions, like to visualize you give it to all sentient beings, and now you're just using it, right? It seems like cheating, but it helps a little bit to let go. You're, just, you're not using it for your own enjoyment, you're using it to benefit others. So, of course, like the lamas, they have possessions, but if you look, they use it to benefit others, and they use it, of course, to, for themselves, to keep healthy, etc., and strong, to be able to benefit others. So that's the kind of attitude. doesn't mean we should give everything away. Pretension or deceit. That is a mental factor that is a type of ignorance or attachment which, motivated by attachment to material possessions, status, etc., wants to pretend that we possess qualities we do not. 
We do, we does not, we do not possess. Okay, we do not possess. So, um, so w what does that mean? It's like because out of status, etc., we pretend we're special. We have a lot of money. Sometimes, sometimes people pretend they're super rich to be able to rub shoulders with the other rich people, for instance, right? So that's due to that's status, for instance. Uh, or do we want material possessions or we believe they may give us a credit, for instance, they may give us some money so because I think we have a lot of money and they get it back or whatever. So it's out of uh, that kind of motivation we are deceitful or we are pretend. Okay, so that's 61. We need to stop it here. So tomorrow we'll finish this text easily. We'll finish easily probably in the morning. And then we have the afternoon and we have Saturday to do the rest. So we can actually finish. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll have some time, of course, for question and answer. So it's a little bit uh, stressful. I mean, a little bit like we need to rush a little bit, but we've got all the other explanation. I've given that to you. So yeah. therefore, I think we can think. Great. Have a lovely evening. I'll see you again tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.